Um, in my clinical job, I'm the head of hematology and oncology at Highland Hospital, which is a safety net hospital. Um, so in America, this is a hospital that cares for patients who are uninsured or poorly insured. And I think a lot of my ideas about de-escalation come from my daily work, either here or in other settings. Um, next slide, please. So these are my conflicts of interest. These are actually both startups that are involved in de-escalation of cancer care. And I may uh, address uh, CADEX genomics, which is very interesting during the discussion. Next. So this is a quote that I think embodies de-escalation, not just in cancer care, but in all areas of medicine, which is we always say less is more as our mantra. And this was just a song that came on the radio as I was driving in the other day. Um, next slide. We've had an evolution of nomenclature, certainly since I've been trained in oncology in the 20th century, we talked about patterns and quality of care and evidence-based medicine. And I originally started studying cost effectiveness at a branch at the NCI with a health economist. Then in the 21st century, we developed new names, value-based cancer care, which is just applying cost effectiveness to cancer care. And our parent organization, Oncology, talked about the Choosing Wisely campaign as a subset of all internal medicine. De-escalation is a term I think I heard after that. And then financial toxicity is a term that was coined by an oncologist at Duke about five years ago to describe the side effects of treatment that affect patients financially. Next. This is a definition of de-escalation. I guess it's my working definition, which is the idea of eliminating treatment above and beyond that which is most useful to the cancer patient. So it, in medicine in general, we tend in America to do too much, to do too many tests, to do too many things to the patient that may not help them. So de-escalation to me re means returning to the level of treatment which is optimal for them without excess treatment or toxicity to maximize the time without symptoms or toxicity. And there's a metric for quality of life that we know about Q-twist, which I don't see used very often, but I think really embodies that and I keep that in my mind when I'm thinking about things clinically. And I think that de-escalation is, is a return to normalcy, that things should not be escalated and that we should strive to get back to what's proper for the patients. Next. There are two things that, that we are taught we can do as physicians and caregivers for patients. One is to make them live longer and two is to make them feel better. So these are sort of our mental goals when we're seeing a patient in clinic and thinking about what to do. Um, things that are beyond this may not actually achieve one of these two goals, and that may be sort of uh, friction in the medical system for the patients, things that don't really help them. Next. There are two main reasons for de-escalation in cancer care. The first is, is basically the uh, principle of medicine that we all try and follow, which is to first do no harm and that we wanna focus on the patient who's in front of us in clinic or in the hospital and treat them in an optimal way, which is not to treat them with tests or medicines that don't help them, that hurt them. There's a second larger reason, which is related to public health, that of distributive social justice and health equity, focusing on all patients, if you think about the whole country, and that's where my interest in health economics, I think, plays out. Next slide. Uh, de-escalation is important for many reasons. Uh, the most important reason, I think, is it's in the patient's best interest to have optimal care, to have as precise a care as possible. And we talk about precision medicine, but one definition of that is treating the patient with the only things that help them and minimizing toxicity and side effects. We want to avoid unnecessary toxic treatments. And one of the principles we think about when treating patients is that we'd want to be treating the patients as if we were the patient ourselves, and we wouldn't want extra things done that didn't really help us. Much of clinical oncology, like other medicine, is about trade-offs between true efficacy and things that are helpful and true toxicity, and we try and maximize and optimize that ratio. Uh, next. Medical care takes time from patients. It often can take hours spent waiting for tests or appointments. A PET scan takes probably a half a day for a patient. And I had a good friend who went through treatment for cancer who would spend basically a day at a center to have a scan and see um, a physician for 15 minutes. This is particularly important when patients have limited time left that we not spend too much time on things that don't help. Unnecessary care can come with risk and adverse events, iatrogenic events and things that hurt the patient. 
And then um, the patient's own toxicity, financial toxicity, which was coined by a, a physician at Duke, Aaron Mitchell wrote a nice uh, essay that we should be treating that with curative intent, which is quite a bold statement. This is what patients pay out of pocket for their medical care um, and medical debt has become a huge problem in, in the United States. Next. Uh, healthcare frequently escalates. Probably the first thing that happens to most patients when they wake up in the hospital is somebody wakes them up at 5 a.m. and draws a CBC and a comprehensive metabolic panel. Um, I've been a, a patient myself over the past decade, about 30 days in the hospital. And when they do this for me and they come in at 5 a.m., I, I chase them away. And I don't think patients know that they can refuse tests, but I don't think these tests are helpful for me. So I tell them to go away and there's a little bit of friction. When we order these tests, we're waking up a patient who's having trouble sleeping. And with the CBC and the CMP, we can have a cascade of unnecessary tests down the road. The cost for these tests are about a thousand a day or more. So when I teach residents, I try and instill this in them, but this is really a tyrannical situation. It's, I think it's most hospitals will do this on most patients most of the time. Um, so we're starting off the day behind the eight ball in terms of de-escalation. Next. Um, if uh, economics is the dismal science, then I like to say that uh, health economics is the most dismal science in America. Um, and also that it's a zero sum game, that if we spend money, for example, on daily labs that we didn't need, we don't have that money for prenatal care for another patient where the money might go to a higher return on investment in improving health care. Next. This is a graph that um, a lot of um, American physicians show because it doesn't shed us in a very good light. We seem to be spending more and more money per patient each year but our benefits are not accruing. Um, part of that is um, that 90% of healthcare is actually due to the social determinants of health rather than the 10% that we do as clinicians. But another part of it, I think, is um, the economic inefficiency of our healthcare system in the United States compared to other um, countries. Next. These are some elements of financial toxicity that have been published in, in many articles and talked about at many conferences in the past couple of years. It's interesting that in the US, more than half of the dollar is diverted for profit. So things that don't really help the patient. We're already uh, working at less than half efficiency there. Um, a recent study showed that a third of Medicare patients can't afford to fill their oral chemotherapy drugs. More than half of Californians actually get their insurance through public. So although the US um, is, is very interested in the private market and um, managed competition. Most insurance is actually public. 42% of newly diagnosed cancer patients go bankrupt within two years of diagnosis, which is a real financial toxicity. And half of women who are battling metastatic breast cancer are being pursued by debt collectors. Our efficiency ranks us about number 50 in healthcare uh, overall. Um, part of this may be um, economic friction. Next slide. Why do we escalate? I think this is the, the first and most important question. I think oncologists tend to be optimists and they wanna believe that the next treatment they have will be the one that really helps the patient. We wanna uh, feel that the treatments we, we have at our armamentarium are effective and, and do a great job. Um, and we feel like we can continue to help the patient. So it's natural optimism that oncologists have. We, we order a lot of tests because of a fear of missing something. And if a test gives you more granular information, there's a fear that if you don't order that test, you'll miss some important bit of information, which may not actually matter clinically. And then this has just become the fashion. So uh, if everybody around you is ordering a PET scan for a patient in remission, you feel out of sorts if you don't do that. So you feel sort of a peer pressure to act as others. And it can affect referral patterns if you're in a situation where um, you're in a competition for patients and you're the one outlier who doesn't do things a certain way. It can affect your own financial livelihood. Next. It's much harder, um, and I've done this uh, previous slide, please. It's much harder to sit and talk to a patient about why you're not going to do something than to just do that. Um, I've had conversations with patients about why we're not going to get a PET scan, and it takes a lot more time out of the day than it does to just click a button and order it. And time is a precious commodity for all physicians. So not all of them will take the time 
to explain why treatment might not work or why a scan isn't needed than it is to just try it. It's very hard to have the end of life conversations with patients emotionally. It's much easier to offer another line of therapy. Um, and then we have some misaligned economic incentives in America. Next. This is um, a slide from an old video game called uh, Sim Hospital, I think, or Sim Medical Care. On the top are the two perspectives that, that I was taught are the most important, the perspective of the patient and the perspective of society. But we have many elements um, in American healthcare that are involved in healthcare, including health tech and startups here in Silicon Valley, where I live nearby, physicians, medical groups, hospitals, pharmaceutical companies. If a patient is not having active treatment or having scans done and you're monitoring them, then you're not generating any revenue within this web. Um, so there's this sort of element that may influence how things are done. Next. This is a rubric for value-based analysis. And we always, I think, want to be on the right side of the curve where we're getting more benefit rather than less. If we can spend less and get more, that's fantastic. That, you know, that's an easy decision to make. If we spend more and get more, that's where we might talk about cost effectiveness or utility. And that's very hard to do clinically. Um, but we don't want to spend less and get less. And actually, if we if we followed this rubric where we eliminated things on the left side, which is basically cost minimization, we probably have a lot more uh, money to care for patients um, a lot better. Next. These are the three goals of cancer care that we were taught um, in fellowship. One is to cure when possible with minimal long-term side effects. So sometimes you can have toxicity in the short run, like a bone marrow transplant if you're going to cure somebody and restore them to their natural state of health. The second one is to prolong overall survival and improve quality of life. And then third is pure palliation. And one of the reasons for escalation is that there's discordance between what the reality of the situation and what the wish is. And patients may often think that they're curable when they're not because of communication and a lack of understanding about what the goal of care actually is. Next. How to de-escalate. Um, this is uh, uh, by Dr. Goldstein, scientific and medical rigor coupled with respectful and empathic communication. It requires really thinking uh, through the situation in front of you, um, analysis of what goal you have and what you need to achieve that, and thinking about each modality that you have to offer a patient, and then choosing wisely. Next. This is a general de-escalation strategies. And I thank Dr. Giwali for pointing this out with, with uh, chemotherapy and immunotherapy would be to treat fewer patients by selecting patients better for treatment, to lower the dose of therapy to that needed to achieve the goal, to decrease the frequency of the therapy to that uh, needed for the goal and to decrease the duration of the treatment to optimize uh, the goal. Next. The Fatal Attraction of Testing is a, is a very interesting essay, essay by uh, Dr. Godwin, and I checked his website. He's a very interesting uh, person with a lot of very interesting quotes. It turns out if you have ovarian cancer patients in remission and you were to watch them and wait for them to have symptoms or not, they would do just as well as the current fashion of checking a tumor marker, CA125, every three months to try and identify a recurrence earlier. And this is a classic lead time bias problem. Um, and it probably does not help the patient to do this, but I, I think across America, everybody does a CA-125 in patients in remission. Part of it may be the patient says they want to know they're still in remission and they don't like the uncertainty of not knowing, but to stop doing this would, would be um, basically unthinkable. I, I think the issue will fade away, as he says. It's too compelling to, to test in this manner. Next slide. ASCO came up with uh, 10 choosing wisely elements, as did all other subspecialties when uh, earlier we were talking about de-escalation over treatment. And some of them are, are very good. Um, some of them should go without saying, but we don't want to give chemo to patients with poor performance status. Um, the use of PET-CT in early stage breast and prostate cancer is actually done a fair bit. And there's some um, escalation of this with a new scan called a PSMA scan in prostate cancer. And here they say no surveillance tumor markers or imaging in breast cancer patients who are in remission and asymptomatic. Um, we do this in ovarian cancer and it's considered 
choosing wisely when we do it. But if we don't do it in breast cancer, that would be considered choosing wisely. And this is still done 33 to 40% of the time. Using medicines to stimulate the bone marrow when they're not needed is one of our choosing wisely. The next slide uh, will have the next five uh, choosing wisely. Minimizing antiemetics is good. I think the second point there, most oncologists uh, are following that one. Um, the avoid using PET or CT scans in follow-up of patients is done very frequently. I've, I've been in several practices, practice situations, and I see it done a lot, even though it's one of our choosing wisely. The PSA testing for prostate cancer has changed a lot in the past two years. And then surprising, the last one, don't use a targeted agent unless the patient has a target. United Health did a survey, and they found that uh, a third of patients who were receiving Herceptin did not have the target of that drug, which is overexpression of HER2. So that is something we definitely should be choosing wisely on. Next. Why don't we choose wisely? There was an <clears throat> article with this title um, in a, about radiation oncologists and why they were giving 10 fractions of radiation for bone metastases when one would do just as well. The two main reasons were misperception of patients about prognosis and goal of treatment. And then there were correlations with who chose 10 rather than one having to do with practicing in the South, high volume practices and years from training. Interestingly, there was a study showing that credit ratings in the South are lower than in the North and this has to do with medical debt. Um, next slide. Some successes of de-escalation, active surveillance for low-grade prostate cancer has really come around in the United States, and that's helped a lot of patients. There's a lot of work on um, minimizing uh, uh, overtreatment of ductal carcinoma in situ, which is not actually a cancer, and papillary thyroid cancer, which has a very indolent course. Uh, shortening the duration of chemotherapy, shortening the total length of chemotherapy in breast cancer. There's a project out of UCSF looking at tailoring mammography to the risk. Uh, a lot of people asking if one year of immunotherapy is as good as two. There's been some really good work in head and neck cancer with de-escalation of treatment in patients who may not need as high a dose in HPV positive head and neck cancer. And in orbital multoma, which is rare, they've discovered that two fractions work as well as uh, 12, this boom, boom is being adopted at many medical centers. Next. De-escalation of imaging. We know that follow-up imaging in Hodgkin's disease and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and remission does not help the patient. It's lead time bias. And if the patients are asymptomatic, it should not be done. This is not one that's followed 100% of the time, but it's one that is out there in the literature. And so it's a great opportunity for de-escalation. Patients don't need a scan. They don't need to give up their data, have a scan. There's some radiation to a scan. Um, there's fear and anxiety, but well, the scan might show and it, it ends up being lead time bias, which we'd like to avoid. Next. Uh, this is something I've thought about de-escalating imaging. So when we developed PET CT scans, suddenly oncologists started ordering them a lot more. But in my clinic, um, the other day, I see a patient with lung cancer who's on a steady dose of an oral medicine and doing fine. And I'm following him with history and physical and chest X-ray and a tumor marker. Um, whereas my colleagues, the physicians I hired, would probably use a CT or a PET CT to follow this type of patient. Again, uh, lead time bias is the reason why that might not be a wise thing to do. Next. Uh, this has been a success story. De-escalation of breast cancer radiation used to be six weeks for all patients post-lumpectomy. Then they developed the three-week external beam regimen, a one-week external beam regimen. There's a great invention by Dr. Michael Baum and Dr. Jan Vadya out of London about intraoperative radiation therapy, where the patient can get a half-hour treatment after surgery. This is not uniformly used in the United States for various reasons, um, but could de-escalate. And then some recent work on identifying patients who are low risk for local recurrence who could safely emit post-lumpectomy radiation. Uh, next. Um, one of the problems with de-escalation is when it's discordant with our commonly accepted guidelines, because this is a harder thing for we oncologists to do. It requires a careful analysis of the clinical evidence focusing on meaningful endpoints, it requires some extra education on how to read a clinical trial and statistics, which is not really taught in medical school, uh, sensitivity, specificity, Bayesian analysis. For me, these are things I learned during my master's in epidemiology and by reading, but they're not taught very well um, in general training. And then the last one, which is um, uh, questioning of the endpoints that are 
uh, being used in clinical trials and whether they're meaningful to the patient. Next. These are um, some withdrawn accelerated approvals that, that may make people ponder whether giving the drug is in the patient's best interest if it's going to be withdrawn in a couple of years. Uh, these are all hematology oncology drugs that were approved based on accelerated uh, approval, but then follow-up studies didn't show them to be effective. Um, while they were approved, they were used widely, um, but then they were withdrawn. And we get really confusing evidence with the PD-1 inhibitors where one company's drug might have a positive trial and another company's drug might have a negative trial based on patient selection. And that becomes a moving target. But it does give you pause about when you use a medicine that's just newly approved your accelerated approval. Next. These uh, are some interesting ones that happened recently. The, the two PIK3 inhibitors in non-Hodgson lymphoma were really used a lot um, before they were withdrawn and blend rapid toxic drug and myeloma. Or latinib and sarcoma, um, somebody calculated that the U.S. spent $500 million on this drug while it was approved um, without any benefit to the patients. And then the story of Avastin and breast cancer has been written a lot about that it was approved for metastatic breast cancer and widely used um, until it was withdrawn, even after it was withdrawn, it remained on our uh, professional guidelines and could still be used. And we don't think any patient really benefited from the use of that medicine. Next. There's a, a great article by the ESMO group. Uh, Bishal was the first author, and I think Nathan Cherney was the last author, that basically shows over the biases in the clinical trial and how to analyze the clinical trial with some great examples. And I try and share this paper widely because it really crystallizes how to think about a cancer clinical trial to deconstruct it and figure out whether there's a role uh, for de-escalation based on the way the trial was done. And these are complicated topics um, that, that are well covered in the paper. Next. Um, some more that are well covered in the paper. Um, and it, uh, it's probably the paper I read most often. It's on my desk and I refer to it a lot when I'm reading a trial. Uh, next. These are some other biases. Um, mortal time bias, I think, was, was in that paper. Lead time bias and length time bias have a lot to do not just in cancer screening, but in deciding treatment and when to treat and imaging and when to image. And then there's always this fitness bias that patients who are enrolled on clinical trials are much fitter with less comorbid illnesses than the patients we see, for example, at a county hospital who may have heart disease and lung disease at the same time. Um, and so one should always sort of read the clinical trial and try and say, is the patient in front of me close enough to the patient in the clinical trial that this makes sense? And that's a very hard and timely thing to do. And there are other biases in a great website called Catalog of Bias that, that has those uh, listed for, for people to look at. Next. What does a surrogate endpoint mean? Um, I think there's been several talks on concilium that really cover this well. To me, it's confusion um, because cancer growth can follow nonlinear dynamics. And when I trained in oncology, we had overall survival and quality of life as our endpoints. So these newer ones, which are used for drug approvals and in clinical trials, are hard to interpret. And we don't actually tell the patient, per se, that this drug will make your x-ray or your CAT scan look better for an extra two months, but you won't live any longer from it because it's sort of obfuscated. Um, particularly if it's like a myeloma trial where all it does is keep the protein at a lower level for an extra three months. It's very hard to translate that in our minds, and it's very hard to explain that to the patients, um, particularly if we have limited time with the patient or limited time to read and analyze the trial uh, carefully. Next. Surrogate endpoints are ubiquitous. 80% of registration trials use progression-free survival as an endpoint. And this is the $60,000 question. Is progression-free survival a good surrogate for overall survival or quality of life? Um, much of the time, it's not. And that makes uh, de-escalation very challenging. Next. Maintenance strategies. Somebody described maintenance strategy as, as eating every five minutes so that you're not hungry at lunch, except that eating can be a toxic chemotherapy drug. And so questioning maintenance strategies is a wise thing to do. I think the first one I saw was maintenance tax on ovarian cancer, which made patients have a lot of toxicity from neuropathy, but didn't make them live longer. Maintenance for toxin follicular lymphoma was very popular for a while, seems to have de-escalated. And so it's a question about who benefits from maintenance therapy. 
including the toxicity and the cost. There's a lot being bandered about, about a trial of using adjuvant osimertinib in lung cancer that doesn't seem to improve the overall survival or curate of patients, which is the goal of adjuvant therapy. Um, and even now, we haven't seen any improvement in overall survival from that drug. So that might be an opportunity to de-escalate. Next. This is a challenging one. Um, when I read these trials, I was myself skeptical because there was no improvement in overall survival. And uh, using these drugs that have side effects without an improvement in overall survival in a patient with metastatic breast cancer um, is widely done. We're, we're told to look for the target for the first drug. Um, and so to not do these, you're sort of going against the grain. And then there was a great article by Dr. Tanik that came out in 2022 that really went over how this happened from informative censorin and his quotes here, a drug that causes net harm and should be withdrawn from the market. Well, that is probably the right opinion about that, but this drug is used widely and it's considered sort of a, a marker of quality of care that you check for the marker for that drug. Interestingly, the two drugs for lymphoma that target that marker were, were withdrawn uh, after accelerated approval. Um, and everolimus is still widely used in this setting, uh, second line. Next. This is a, a recent trial that's baffling a little bit. This is a great drug in the sense that we have a target, a KRAS mutation and a targeted drug. And that's appealing because we saw such great results with imatinib and chronic myelogenous leukemia. It's oral, but it does not improve overall survival and it has side effects. So it's hard to make a lot of a, of a surrogate endpoint, even though this drug is, is guideline listed and FDA approved at this point. Next. Um, this is a <clears throat> relatively rare disease, but it illustrates a problem in that um, when I treat these patients, I will give them bendamustine rituximab and see how long they're in remission. Um, and you can use a brutinib second line. The trial showed no difference on overall survival or quality of life by using this maintenance strategy of this drug, which does have risks of AFib, um, sudden cardiac death, bleeding and rash. And we could easily de-escalate to just bendamustine rituximab and delay starting a brutinib until progression with uh, actually helping the patient uh, out. Um, so it's going against the grain to see this trial published in the New Journal of Medicine and then question it and do something different. Next. Probenge is a, a really interesting drug. When the trial came out, I wrote an editorial about it because it did not lower the PSA or shrink anything, but it seemed to improve the overall survival of patients with prostate cancer. And it turned out to be a problem with um, the control arm being put on a dummy drug for four months that delayed the time until they got an effective drug, docetaxel. So the overall survival may be just a spurious event. Um, and an oncologist would be um, perhaps in their, in their right to question using this drug, which costs $300,000 and doesn't seem to help the patient. But it is a widely used uh, therapy. Next. Um, this trial has been critiqued by several oncologists um, in that patients were uh, responding to a standard regimen, and then in the placebo arm, that regimen was stopped. And in the treatment arm, they were given a targeted drug. Again, targeted drugs are very interesting molecularly because we're identifying the target. In the placebo arm, there was an almost 10% response rate. And if you look at the Kaplan-Meier plot, it crosses at several points, which, which means it's probably not interpretable. But this is now a standard guideline to test for this mutation in all these patients and have this therapy waiting in the wings to offer them. Next. Um, the Choosing Wisely has a, has a economic and societal goal of de-escalation to diminish financial toxicity. And some uh, areas of research such as interventional pharmacogenomics are focused on this. I'll have some examples in the next slide. Um, this is a, a great natural history of this drug. This is the uh, Martha Stewart drug, a monoclonal antibody for colon cancer. At first, we gave this patients to this drug to all patients, and we saw responses um, very infrequently. Then we found out that there was a mutation, and the patients who had that mutation would not respond. That research was done in France, and when it was implemented, 30 million euros a year were saved. And it took about three or four years until we started applying those results in the United States. Then we figured out that patients with certain mutations were non-responsive and that uh, the side of the colon mattered. 
and that a rare HER2 overexpression. So now we're treating only 15% of the patients down from 100%, but our response rate is 85%. So this is a real success story in precision oncology by making the treatment more precise, minimizing toxicity and, and maximizing efficacy. This is a real win over time. Next. Uh, treatment holidays. There's some literature on this in colon cancer and refractory cancer. Craig Geddy wrote a great article that this may actually prolong overall survival patients by giving holidays. I don't know all this literature that well. Uh, two patients I saw in this week, one with metastatic cervical cancer and one with metastatic endometrial cancer. Their scans look good. And I said, let's stop treatment and see what happens. And they're both about a year and a half out with no treatment, which I think has improved their quality of life. Um, if I'd given them stereotactic radiosurgery, I might've said that did it, but I didn't in either case. And I have a, a cohort of patients like this where I try to give them treatment holidays. And I think it's a very good strategy to, to investigate further. Next. Uh, De-escalation chronic myelogenous leukemia. Um, this is in the DaVita textbook, actually, that first line imatinib, which is generic, maybe $17 a month, works as well as the second line therapies, which are more potent, um, and that appropriate patients can stop their medicine completely in 40% and will be disease-free. Again, that's a study that I think came out of France and England. And then Dr. Contargen is talking about how you can reduce the dose of these second-generation medicines, which will reduce the cost and toxicity. Um, not an incredibly common cancer, but one where we could really optimize care by de-escalating to using a generic drug first line. Next. Uh, biosimilar substitution, um, I've, I've written some articles where you would think that 100% substitution would happen because the drug works just as well at a lower cost, um, but it's not 100%. It varies a lot from that. <clears throat> um, even in European countries, we're not up to yet 100%, but this would be a huge opportunity for cost savings with keeping the patient con uh, outcome exactly the same. And we could use that mon money for other things, including um, low and middle income countries, perhaps. Next. This is a, a great group of uh, interventional pharmacoeconomics, Dan Goldstein and Mark Retain and, and Garth Strobin and some others who are looking at things, some of the um, uh, things they've come out with have to do with doses, the, the use of abiraterone with a low fat meal to lower the dose by 75% and save 75% of money. Uh, Weight-based Keytruda dosing, one of the PD-1 inhibitors can be given every six weeks. So that saves 25% and it saves the patient an extra visit to the clinic by going from every three weeks to every six weeks. A trial that's getting a lot of press is very low dose use of PD-1 inhibitors um, with a great result in, in India. It turns out these drugs don't have a dose response curve that 0.1 milligrams per kilogram works as well as a much higher dose. And the dose that we use now, which is fixed dosing, is somewhat arbitrary. So there's a great opportunity here for dose de-escalation um, if we want it. Uh, next. De-escalation at the end of life, um, you know, I think in America, we don't refer our patients to hospice early enough because we don't like to have the end of life conversation, but it really is in the patient's best interest to understand what the goal of care is and to make informed decisions um, at the end of life. We see patients who are admitted to the ICU inappropriately and who pass away there rather than at home. We see a lot of heroic use of immunotherapy and targeted therapy in the last 30 days of life with no benefit. Um, we have a very low average time on hospice in five cancers, it was uh, shown in a well study. Um, and, and the way to do this is to introduce palliative care to patients with metastatic cancer much earlier in their treatment. Um, at my hospital, we do this, I think, well, because we have a palliative care clinic in the same clinic as us, and so we can send the patients there um, and they can have some of those conversations. But I, I trained at a time when we didn't have palliative care as a separate discipline, and we needed to have those conversations ourselves. And there's a way to do the end-of-life conversations that's respectful and honorable and optimizes the patient outcome that can be taught. Next. Pass forward. Um, you know, a great opportunity would be design prospective clinical trials with economic endpoints and quality of life measurements. These would probably be, have to be from the perspective of the payer, um, from a national um, insurance platform, a, a single party payer, because it's it's targeted at society as well as the patients. And we don't see very many of these trials and it'd be great to have more of them. This is a great opportunity for collaboration between high income countries and lower income countries where many of the chemotherapy drugs that are very, very effective are not available to their 
uh, patients because of economic issues. And next. So in conclusion, this is a very difficult topic to grasp, uh, but it's very well worthwhile to do it, um, to spend some intellect and some psychology thinking about why we escalate care and how we can de-escalate care will help patients tremendously. Um, it's a growing movement. We see more literature about this, more conferences, more groups focused on this. Um, there are financial reasons to do this as financial pressures continue to mount and medical debt increases and the cost curve continues to break and the healthcare system continues to, to suffer. It may become fashionable for financial reasons. And then there's philosophical reasons, as uh, Lao Tzu said, you know, you only want to use as much force as necessary. I think philosophically in treating patients, you only want to treat patients as much as necessary. And as much as this talk has been about cancer care, de-escalation applies to, to sort of all aspects of medical care. Um, so thank you for listening. I'm happy to discuss and take questions now. Um, thank you very much, Kevin. So I am closing the slides. Please turn on your cameras, uh, raise your hands to ask Kevin any questions. A very important talk. And um, it's my, my, my first question to you would be, are you aware of any studies between comparing Europe and the US uh, on the difference in terms of amount of treatments used for particular um, tumor type or the, the burden of treatment, uh, how, how much more U.S. is doing or uh, escalation of cancer care has been similar across the board and that we need to de-escalate everywhere? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm looking forward to this talk because I've never practiced in Europe and I know that escalation of care is a huge problem in the United States and, and less of a problem in Europe. Um, where most of the countries there have a single party payer that has some sort of economic guardrails, such as NICE, where many drugs we use here are not approved for use in England. Um, so definitely there's much better de-escalation, I think, in European countries than there is in America. There is sort of this fashion of doing what we're doing in America there. So, for example, fixed dose of PD-1 inhibitors probably is commonly done in Europe. The studies that are done are, are not, you know, prospective randomized, obviously. They're sort of um, review articles and theme pieces. Um, and uh, I'm very interested in how Europe does things because I think, you know, de-escalation is something we should all strive for. Um, and uh, we have a less efficient healthcare system because of the way healthcare is paid for in America that may encourage escalation of care. Yeah. Um, thank you, Kevin. So, uh, Sylvia, please go ahead. Sorry. Hi, everybody. I'm a medical oncologist and I'm, uh, well, now not anymore in the clinic, but in the research and I'm a GI guy, girl. Uh, thank you very much, Kevin. You had fantastic talk, fun really fantastic talk. Thank I would you. like to say um, a couple of things. Um, first of all, give you some good example and bad example of de-escalation and non-de-escalation in GI cancer. Um, in, in, in rectal cancer, and at this very moment, there is a lot of uh, talking about the non procedures, uh, meaning no no um, surgical management after uh, an escalated uh, chemotherapy, a neoadjuvant uh, chemotherapy. These are really important things because, uh, as you know, radical uh, the surgery for rectal cancer is radical, and this is there are several uh, trials going on, uh, including one of mine. Uh, but the the results are really very interesting, and coupled with the use of uh, PD one uh, antibodies in 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 MSI patient, which are really giving. Uh, a restitutio di integrum of the, of the disease, uh, um, it seems to me that that is a good, very good example of de-escalation. Um, on the other hand, unfortunately, um, there is a lot of um, uh, increased uh, neoadjuvant treatment in stage four patient, uh, uh, either oligometastatic or, or even not, with the hope of making that them operable, which they become, but then uh, they, the, the tumor is not really eradicated by surgery, and therefore the value of that is really, really very flimsy, and you should look into the two trials that have shown this. Um, 
However, I think that this is a very good period for the de-escalation because there are several new technology. First of all, liquid biopsy that will allow us to really select the patient that are in need of treatment. Um, I've, I've just terminated a trial, uh, well, 30 years ago, I think I was one of the people that started a trial for demonstrating that you needed chemotherapy and uh, in, in stage uh, two, three, uh, two high risk, three uh, uh, colon cancer. And we needed to treat all in order to save uh, some and increase the survival rate between 10 to 15%, according to what you say. Uh, then followed a thousand year, really well, 20 years of uh, incredibly stupid trial, uh, pardon my French, of three versus six. We had to end up, end up with more than 20,000 patients uh, uh, treated three versus six and still not a firm answer on that. Obviously, because it was not on the biology of the tumor, but just on the length of treatment. Now, liquid biopsy has shown us uh, that we can do otherwise. And in the current trial that I've just closed, and, and I'm going to open another one in six months from now, um, I figured that, we figured out that uh, practically 70, 75% of the patients that are now treated with mostly six months of full fox, uh, a, reg a regimen that uh, uh, leave a 15 to 20% uh, permanent neurotoxicity uh, damage, uh, really don't need to have any treatment because after the surgery, they have no micrometastatic disease. There is no uh, way, there is no ctDNA in the blood of this patient 30 days after surgery, which means that uh, um, since the, 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 the DNA leave, leaves, uh, has a half-life of two hours in the blood, that there are uh, if it's present, there are metastatic sites that micrometastatic sites that we cannot see. Um, whereas if it is not, including you know a, a certain a number of false negatives that you have to accept, uh, still we are over treating seventy five percent of the of the patient, and this is something that it's very very difficult to make a physician understand. Um, I think, and then I'm going to close this that uh, um, one of the major reason, it's also because the guideline, we, we have kind of created a monster with evidence base in a way. Um, I, you know, I was instrumental in my country 30 years ago to introduce the concept of evidence base with doing large randomized clinical trial. But now uh, the combination of evidence medicine guideline and the, in, how would I say, the fragmentation that, uh, uh, the industry imposes uh, in the timeline between the diagnosis and the death of the patient, if the patient is not responding, has created monsters. For instance, again, in colon cancer, you cannot test a new, uh, a new drugs unless you are in fourth line. However, the first, second, and third line, um, which are established are after the first line, it's not clear because nobody has really done the trials uh, that need to be done to establish what is the real, um, uh, um, uh, the, the real benefit that is given by the second and third line to, with very toxic regimen to the overall survival of the patient. Now, again, here, I think that we need markers uh, to convince people that, uh, uh, we can predict for, for instance, refractariness to, to chemotherapy in frontline. As you said, there are no good uh, um, um, proxy of, of survival usually, but in the case of colon cancer, it has been proven by a variety, by, by, by Mark Boys and his group in, in Belgium, that, there is, that response, it's a good proxy of survival in late disease. However, response, it's only obtained during frontline. Second and third line responses are close to zero. Uh, that notwithstanding, because of the fact of using another non-good uh, um, proxy, which is PFS, we continue to, uh, you know, uh, allow industry to uh, say that this drug is splendid because it uh, acts, uh, you know, adds uh, 1.5 months of PFS. Uh, um, to the patient. And I think that this is something that uh, 
we need to discuss more uh, the, right. the, the bad influence of these three things put together. Gu you know, guidelines uh, should be more restrictive uh, than just saying, you know, there is one trial which uh, 1.5 months uh, PFS, and therefore it will be unethical not to give this drug to the patient. Right. Right. You, everything you say is true. Um, you know, in colon cancer, I, I was reading recently that there's really no need to add oxaliplatin unless you have four more positive nodes. There's no incremental benefit. But across the U.S., everybody will give it for any node positivity and stage two disease. And I think the ctDNA may help de-escalate care, although I see it also escalating care. We have minimal, resid minimal residual disease testing in myeloma with no evidence that treating to maximal minimal residual disease will make the patients live longer. So it's a double-edged sword. We and um, trying to do that. <laughs> there's a, there's, I think many of you have read the article, Evidence-Based Medicine Has Been Hijacked, a letter to David Sackett, and I think that describes some of what's going on. I will briefly mention one of the companies I'm, I'm working with, Cadex Genomics, we, we have an assay um, based on um, fragment sizes that are expressed by cancer ubiquitously. And the way it works is by day 20, you, you can check this assay. And if it's going up, that means the cancer is not, the chemotherapy is not working or the immunotherapy is not working. So we hope to use this to de-escalate by saying, you know, you're starting an immunotherapy. You normally have to wait nine weeks to see if it's working or not. By day 20, you could say it's not working and drop it from the regimen. Um, if the, if the assay uh, doesn't go up, it doesn't mean it's working for sure. Then you follow the usual imaging and things like that. But I, I'm very interested in this CADEX assay, and I think it, if it goes forward, it'll have a lot of opportunity, particularly in the third world, where patients are paying for chemotherapy out of pocket to de-escalate care. So that's why that's a conflict of interest. If I can add to that, and then I'll close it. Um, sure. We're trying to do liquid biopsy test, to, uh, delta liquid biopsy, basal versus the first, uh, the liquid biopsy, the first uh, um the first CT uh, uh, scan in immunotherapy uh, treated patient to see if we can, by uh, gauging the curve of the quantitative diminishment of the, the, the ctDNA, um, predict whether there will be a long-term or a not long-term response. And the preliminary data are very interesting. There are some data already out in head and neck cancer suggesting that if the if the drugs, if the sorry, if the, the liquid biopsy doesn't drop, uh, the, the, the ctDNA doesn't drop, then there is no point in treating the patient with six months of uh, yep. expensive and not so non-toxic <laughs> immunotherapy, especially at the doses that we which we yeah. are using. Right. We, we hope this uh, is used wisely, this, this new technology. I don't think the grail, you know, for screening for cancer has good performance characteristics and people are very excited about that in the States. Thank you, Solia. So we have two questions in the chat. One is from Irni and another one is from Lydia. So um, Kevin, you can read them, but I'll okay. just read uh, the out loud, the first question. From Irni, whether you can expand uh, more on IVP trial collaborations between developed and developing countries, and um, well, where's the trial run? Who are the sponsors? Mm. Uh, yeah, I think that there are some groups that the IVPE and other groups that are that are talking and and perhaps designing some of these trials. Um, you know, a great one would be to see about um, dose ranges for PD one therapy and translating what happened in India over here, the sponsors would have to be government agencies or maybe in America insurance companies because they're the ones that are interested in the outcome. Um, so I haven't myself seen a lot of trials like this. I think maybe that'll be the topic of a future talk um, here that um, I'll come and listen to. Others may know more about trials that are being designed that way. And I, I'm trying to get into that, that field myself. Thank you, Kevin. So another long comment and question from Lydia. So if um, you can share your so thoughts on the um, EBCP flagship six, the new cancer diagnostic and treatment for all initiative, which will be launched uh, at the end of the, which was launched at the end of 2009 and will uh -huh. help improve access to innovative cancer diagnosis and treatments. Um, and it promises to use the next generation sequencing technology for quick and efficient genetic profiles of tumor cells, allowing cancer centers to share cancer profiles and applying the same or similar diagnostics and therapeutic approaches to patients with comparable um, 
cancer profiles. So the initiatives uh, will ultimately help optimize cancer diagnosis and treatment and reduce unequal access to personalized medicine and cancer care. So are you aware of this initiative? Any comments? Uh, can I just comment, sorry, the EBC is the Europe's beating cancer plan for your information. And this is really what the European decision makers are yeah. now putting there. And we are very worried about this because we think there is a lack of data and they're just going to push through. And we don't know how to kind of fight against that. <laughs> so happy yeah, to I hear mean, you. You need, a, you need a group of rational, scientifically thinking people to to look at that honestly i mean what happens in the us is every patient gets next generation sequencing and they find a target and they try a drug and when you actually read the evidence about how well that drug works a lot of the time no you know like sometimes the targets are really important and you can get really great results but in america it's done almost ubiquitously patients are asking for it the drugs that are used are very expensive usually 15 to 20,000 dollars a month um and the results are not always staggering and um, there's a lot of momentum to do next generation sequencing on every patient. And, you know, there's a lot of questions. Is, is the genomic profile of the cancer at the time you do the sequencing the same as it is after they've had two or three lines of chemotherapy? You know, it's, it's different even in one part of a tumor versus another. Um, and there's a lot of, you know, buzzwords, precision medicine and AI and um, um, decision inference analysis that's behind that. And so I think that train has left the station. I'm not sure how to apply rationality to that. You know, to me, the economics are are the way to apply rationality because somebody has to pay for these experiments. Um, and I'm hoping that there'll be a way to do that, particularly in Europe, where you will have single party payer systems. And well, I, you know, I don't know how the people in the budgetary deal with when they see these rising costs. You know, do they say, what outcomes are we getting for this? That's, I think where to go but another way to deal with it maybe might be just to really analyze the data and write papers and try and get it out there to to people even in the newspapers that this is you know um, chasing a pipe dream rather than actually helping patients next generation Thanks. sequencing is both good and bad but there's a lot of hype behind it and you know in america every every cancer center has a precision medical institute um, with a large building and and there's uh, definitely a lot of hope. As we say, oncology are optimists. They're very optimistic about the utility of next generation sequencing for their patients. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we will try. <laughs> and I'd love to learn more about that. I'd love to learn more about that. Just for your information, EORTC, the European Organization for Research on Cancer, they are pushing hard for the uh, de-escalation for checkpoint inhibitors, and they are setting up they have set up a trial on that topic, so maybe uh, that's an organization that's very much interested in this. Uh, they could easily do the weight-based dosing, and then they could start looking at uh, a lower yeah. dose per milligram or kilogram and, and save, save a lot of uh, toxicity and, and a lot of uh, expense. Yeah.